things, that sort of thing. That you can tap into their deepest desires or their deepest fears and use that to your own purposes. And then, in 1928, a president came to power who agreed with Bernays. President Hoover was the first politician to articulate the idea that consumerism had become the central motor of American life. After his election, he told a group of advertisers and public relations men, you have taken over the job of creating desire and have transformed people into constantly moving happiness machines. Machines which have become the key to economic progress. What was beginning to emerge in the 1920s was a new idea of how to run mass democracy. At its heart was the consuming self, which not only made the economy work, but was happy and docile, and so created a stable society. Both Bernays and Littmann's concept of managing the masses takes the idea of democracy and it turns it into a palliative. It turns it into uh, giving people some kind of feel-good med medication that will respond to an immediate pain or an immediate yearning, but will not alter the objective circumstances one iota. I mean, democracy really, the idea of democracy at its heart was about changing the relations of power that had governed the world for so long. And Bernays' concept of democracy was one of maintaining the relations of power even if it meant that one needed to sort of stimulate the psychological lives of the public. And in fact, in his mind, that was what was necessary. That if you can keep stimulating the irrational self, then leadership can basically go on doing what it wants to do. Bernays now became one of the central figures in a business elite that dominated American society and politics in the 1920s. He also became extremely rich and lived in a suite of rooms in one of New York's most expensive hotels, where he gave frequent parties. Oh my goodness, he had a home in the corner suite of the Sherry Netherland Hotel. And here's this wonderful suite with all these windows looking out on Central Park and across at the plaza and on the square. And he would use this place to hold a soiree. The mayor would come. All the media leaders would come, the political leaders, the business leaders, the people in the arts. I mean, it was a who's who. People wanted to know Eddie Bernays because, you know, he himself became a, a sort of a famous man, a sort of a magician who could make these things happen. He knows everybody. He knows the mayor and he knows the senator and he calls politicians on the telephone as if he did get a, 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 literally a, a high or a bang out of doing what he did and that's fine but it, it can be a little hard on the people around you especially when you make other people feel stupid the people who worked for him were stupid and children were stupid and if people did things in a way that he didn't that he wouldn't have done them they were stupid that was it was a word that he used over and over and over dope and stupid and the masses they were stupid But Bernays' power was about to be destroyed dramatically, and by a type of human irrationality, he could do nothing to control. At the end of October 1929, Bernays organized a huge national event to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the invention of the light bulb. President Hoover, the leaders of major corporations, and bankers like John D. Rockefeller were all summoned by Bernays to celebrate the power of American business. But even as they gathered, news came through that shares on the New York Stock Exchange were beginning to fall catastrophically. Throughout the 1920s, speculators had borrowed billions of dollars. The banks had promoted the idea that this was a new era where market crashes were a thing of the past. But they were wrong. What was about to happen was the biggest stock market crash in history. Investors had panicked and begun to sell in a blind, relentless fury that no reassurance by bankers or politicians could halt. 
and on the 29th of October 1929, the market collapsed. The effect of the crash on the American economy was disastrous. Faced with recession and unemployment, millions of American workers stopped buying goods they didn't need. The consumer boom that Bernays had done so much to engineer disappeared, and he and the profession of public relations fell from favor. Bernays's brief moment of power seemed to be over. The effect of the Wall Street crash on Europe was also catastrophic. It intensified the growing economic and political crisis in the new democracies. In both Germany and Austria, there were violent street battles between the armed wings of different political parties. Against this backdrop, Freud, who was suffering from cancer of the jaw, retreated yet again to the Alps. He wrote a book called Civilization and Its Discontents. It was a powerful attack on the idea that civilization was an expression of human progress. Instead, Freud argued, civilization had actually been constructed to control the dangerous animal forces inside human beings. What was implicit in Freud's argument was that the ideal of individual freedom, which was at the heart of democracy, was impossible. Human beings could never be allowed to truly express themselves because it was too dangerous. They must always be controlled and would thus always be discontent. Man doesn't want to be civilized and he is, as I want to, civilization uh, brings discontent, but it is necessary to survive, otherwise he couldn't survive. So he must be discontent, because this would be the only way to keep him <laughs> within limits. But what did Freud think about the idea of the equality of man? He didn't believe in it. We had 32 parties, and Hitler said, before those parties don't vanish, there is no Germany. That's true. You can't have 32 parties, and so they felt this one person will put an end to this comedy. Freud was not alone in his pessimism. Politicians like Adolf Hitler emerged from a growing despair in the 1920s about democracy. The Nazis were convinced that democracy was dangerous because it unleashed a selfish individualism, but didn't have the means to control it. Hitler's party, the National Socialists, stood in elections, promising in their propaganda they would abandon democracy because of the chaos and unemployment it led to. Die Parteien versprachen den Himmel auf Erden. In March 1933, the National Socialists were elected to power in Germany and they set out to create a society that would control human beings in a different way. One of their first acts was to take control of business. The planning of production would in future be done by the state. The free market was too unstable, as the crash in America had proved. Workers' leisure time was also planned by the state through a new organization called Strength Through Joy. One of its mottos was service, not self. But the Nazis did not see this as a return to an old form of autocratic control. It was a new alternative to democracy, in which the feelings and the desires of the masses would still be central. But they would be channeled in such a way as to bind the nation together. The chief exponent of this was Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda. Es mag gut sein, Macht zu besitzen, die auf Gewehren ruht. Besser aber und beglückender ist es, das Herz eines Volkes zu gewinnen und es auch zu behalten.